John chapter 4, John chapter 4, we'll read the first 10 verses tonight, John chapter 4 and verse 1. John chapter 4 and verse 1, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus unto the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask this drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Uh, tonight's message is a continuation in the uh, series on spiritual warfare. And uh, we're going to be turning a little corner here uh, from directly talking about spiritual warfare and the weapons of our warfare and, and the warfare in our own life uh, to turning that outward in engaging in the warfare in such a way that we are uh, helping other people and we are promoting deliverance in other people's lives. Now let's go to the Lord in prayer. So the title of the message tonight is Meet People Where They're At. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, your word and for the opportunity to be here this evening. And thank you for all that are here. And I pray that you would bless the message, that you would uh, speak to every heart through the preaching of your word, and that you would help us have attentive ears and hearts, that we would learn these things, grasp these things, to get the right perspective and mindset of what you want and uh, how we can effectively uh, minister to others through spiritual warfare. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated meet people where they're at. And we're going to look tonight at two examples from the Gospel of John and the life of Christ and some people he dealt with uh, in how he helped others. Now, these passages are not necessarily spiritual warfare passages in the traditional sense of talking about the weapons of our warfare or putting on the whole armor of God as we've, uh, or, or the battle of the mind, which we uh, have, have, have uh, covered uh, those things in recent weeks. Um, but we are... Um, but at the same time, this is a part of spiritual warfare, uh, is, is engaging by, what we, let's put it this way, if we are going to promote deliverance in other people's lives, we are going to have to enter into warfare and it's eff eff effectively wage a spiritual battle. It is spiritual warfare if we're going to ever make a difference in people's lives in helping them, uh, not just uh, preaching the gospel, but also helping them be delivered from the bondage that they're in. Um, there are so many cases of, uh, so many examples, people we hear about, whether it's people that we might know or have a connection with, or maybe people we just maybe hear about, at least I read about maybe in the news, of things that are going on in people's hearts and lives. And in this last year and a half, uh, anxiety has skyrocketed in people's lives and depression and all kinds of, of uh, mental health types of things uh, that have... Um, uh, that have, have just skyrocketed. Uh, and while we might not initially look at that as, a, as in dealing with that as spiritual warfare, it is spiritual warfare because the devil is using that to keep people in bondage and to destroy people's lives. Uh, and also then we hear about people with uh, anxiety. We talk about you know, someone who's you know, uh, dealing with anxiety attacks and or anxiety and panic attacks. And that is it is more and more com more common than what we would really like to think, um, but that is spiritual warfare. Helping someone to deal with that is spiritual warfare. As a matter of fact, just this afternoon I read a uh, an article, and I I'll probably share this in a future message in more detail. Um, so that's why I don't have it have it for tonight to actually read part of it. But to summarize. Uh, it was an article about how there's an unusual rise in young women, uh, like teenage, mid-teens, uh, later teen girls, who are seeing doctors uh, for ticks. Not, not the bug ticks, <laughs> uh, but the, in, the involuntary movements. You know, someone's got a movement like this. And, or sometimes ticks... Uh, uh, 
or an actual, if someone actually has a medical problem that causes that, we would call it Tourette's uh, syndrome. And, um, and what they're, so, so there are doctors in different places that are noticing an uptick, uh, no pun intended, uh, an uptick in ticks. <laughs> I didn't say that on purpose. Um, but they're noticing an increase in the number of people that they are. Now, it's not like just hordes and hordes, like hundreds and thousands of people, but they're seeing more than usual. And so they're wondering, well, what is ca causing this? What is the common denominator? And what is interesting about this is that um, one of the common numbers, well, first of all, a lot of these individuals are ones who are already dealing with anxiety and, and mental health type of issues. So this is just a continuation or an escalation of what these people are already dealing with. But they're also noticing that there's uh, a common denominator of them watching TikTok videos Interesting, it's called Tick, uh, TikTok. Um, of there's actually people on TikTok, these young women, these young girls, that are claiming to have Tourette's. And so they get on these TikTok videos and they are speaking, you know, repeating the same words over and over, uh, like blurting out words. Um, they're having these supposedly involuntary movements. And you, and the, and so there's a tr like a trending type even thing of Tourette's on TikTok. And uh, the doctors are saying this is very unusual because Tourette's is usually not common for girls and uh, uh, teenage girls. That is not a common age to see Tourette's syndrome. But they're wondering what if there's a connection with some of this with the influence of seeing people with these tics and with these, these blurting out words that uh, is then having an impact on the minds of these girls who are watching these TikTok videos. Now, I very rarely have I seen anything on TikTok, but the way that TikTok is designed, I've seen enough to know, the way TikTok is designed, it is designed to addict you. It is designed to hook you in. Now, you could say the same thing about YouTube, or you could say the same thing about Facebook or Twitter, but there's actually, the way that the videos are done, uh, I think a lot of them are these really short clips that just repeat and repeat, so if you don't stop it, is that right, Jordan? Yeah. 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 Is, that, is that generally what TikTok is? Um, so it's these short video clips that then just go on loops unless you stop it, which has, can have a very addictive effect. Uh, if you, if, if, I mean, just, it mesmerizes you, it's just, it's just running and you get mesmerized by it. And, uh, that was just the very little exposure I've had to TikTok and it, and that convinced me of saying, well, I never had a desire to be on TikTok and that just doubles my, uh, determination. I will never be on TikTok and I will not be using TikTok. It's, it's, it's the utter, it's the utter vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Uh, type of social media platform. Now, Facebook is used for vanity as well. You know, there's a lot of things that can be used for vain purposes, but TikTok, you're just talking about these little short video clips. All it is is it's, it's attention-seeking people trying to grab a crowd is what it is in their vanity, in their, in their vein. So, so one example was a, woman, a, a girl who was uh, having these tics and she was blurting out these words, and one of the words uh, that they said it was, was beans, beans. Well, come to find out there was somebody on TikTok who was claiming to have Tourette's and they would blurt out the word beans. So utterly bizarre, utterly bizarre. But what, what does this go back to? Well, this goes back to what well, last week, it's a battle for the mind. There's a warfare in the mind and these, these influences that are out there are messing with people's minds and are having very drastic uh, consequences. Uh, very bad effects, detrimental effects. And we recognize it's a spiritual battle. It really is a spiritual battle because the devil is using this, uh, these things to, to uh, just ruin people's lives, to waste people's lives, and to uh, 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 just uh, uh, cause, uh, just bring people into bondage. Bring people into bondage. You know, it's, like I say, it's bad enough, the addictiveness of Facebook and some of those other ones, but I found TikTok to be on another level, personally. I don't know if you've found that. Maybe, maybe Jordan's a big TikTok star and we don't know it. But well, also, you know what they do is they customize it to your liking. Oh, okay. So it's addictive that way. Ah, uh, there you go. See more of what you uh, target. 
Oh, okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. Uh, and is it typical for people to do videos where they play a clip of something that's not them talking, but they're mouthing the words? Is that, is that something that's common? Because just in the little bit of the videos I saw, that's what they were doing. They, they're playing a clip of something else. It could be an actor. It could be a clip from a movie, just the audio, and they're mouthing the words. It was just utterly weird. It was just, just uh, <laughs> it, it really it blew my mind. It just, it just boggled my mind. But I found that, that this is happening. I just read that article of uh, these teenage girls who are having these issues uh, there's an increase of these issues, and we're hearing about the teenage girls who have our anxiety issues and, and panic. And so uh, there's a great spiritual battle, and we need to be in a position where we are able to help others, be in the best position we can be to help others. And if we're effectively engaging in the spiritual warfare in our own life, and we're living in victory in our own life, that puts us in the best position to be uh, a help to others and help promote deliverance. Uh, in other people's lives. And so the, the focus of the message tonight is to meet people where they're at, because uh, when you really delve into it and you start to, to, to be in a position where you help people and can promote deliverance in people's lives, you can get to the root of the issues uh, and know how to get to the root of the issues. Um, you got to meet people where they're at, because there's people in all kinds of situations and circumstances and frames of mind. And what we'll see in Jesus' case is he did meet people where they're at. He never condoned sin and he always pointed people to himself and to repentance uh, as far as uh, uh, and we'll, we'll see this tonight but but that's really the main point of the message is as we shift from the focus on spiritual warfare and the weapons of our warfare uh, to now how do we we're going to shift into practically helping people how do we best do that how do we best as part of our spiritual warfare how do we then help others and in, in, as we engage in that battle. Now, Jesus went through Samaria uh, and he went to Jacob's well and a woman came and Jesus requested a, a drink from her. And uh, she recognized that he was a Jew. And so she's really uh, surprised that he's even there asking her, a Samaritan woman, because the Jews and Samaritans get, didn't get along very well. And so Jesus said in verse, and, and Jesus talked about living water in verse 10, and so what he's trying to do here is he's working, he's working this process to lead her to the point where he's going to tell her who he is, but he wants her to recognize her need first. And so that's the process that he uh, uses here. And so first of all, number one here in John chapter 4 is that Jesus didn't limit who he would talk with. He didn't use, he didn't have ethnic boundaries. Uh, he didn't just... He, he didn't, well, you know, the Samaritans, I don't think I really want to deal with them. Uh, or, you know, to, in modern times, you know, we could maybe, you know, pick a group of people, pick a state, pick a city, pick a, a type of person, and say, well, I don't really want to deal with them. No, as, as Christians, and if we're, we're more than conquerors through Christ, and we live, in, and faith is the victory that overcomes the world, and we have the victor living inside of us, uh, we are in a position where we can literally, literally, talk to anybody and promote Jesus Christ and promote deliverance in their life. If we truly are walking in victory and in, 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 in Christ and ready to engage and properly ready to engage in the warfare and we get this perspective, there, there's literally no limit to who we could talk to and help and promote deliverance. Nobody's too far gone in the Lord's eyes. Now, humanly speaking, there are people who look like they're too far gone but uh, there are some real hard cases out there. There are some people in really dire straits that from a human perspective, we just, well, I don't know what to do. But when you really get into it with the spiritual battle and you learn to meet people where they're at and you deal with people like Jesus dealt with people uh, and, and you recognize the victory that is available in Christ, uh, you, you get to be more confident of saying, no, I, I may not know all the answers right now for this person, but I know there's a, there's a Savior who has the answers. And so he didn't limit. He didn't limit himself uh, just to the Jews. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was uh, the Jews that uh, many of them um, were, especially in his hometown, were the most, uh, re not, uh, most unreceptive to his message. And so he comes to Samaria, and what you'll find is that there were many people in that town who 
were receptive to who he was and they believed on him. But he didn't limit who he would talk with. Um, working in, uh, in the general public and uh, any of us that have, have done that, we've, we've gotten to meet a few people along the way that from an earthly standpoint look pretty hopeless. Um, and you, you met a few of them in the ER probably uh, <laughs> years ago when we were first married. And, uh, you know, I'm sure they, they flock to Staples, you know, mostly. I don't know. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, Jordan has had um, experience in the general public and meeting, working with people. And so, and of course, I have too. And so we, we meet these people. Now, what's exciting to me, when you start to grab hold of these principles that we're going to be covering as we get into these next few weeks, um, Lord willing, what's exciting to me is that I don't look at people now as saying, oh, you know, that person's kind of strange. That person's kind of crazy. Like, what's wrong with them? I actually look at them and say, hmm, you know, my mind goes back to the same place of, wonder what happened in their life that led them to this point. And, I, and if I were to able to sit down and talk with them and they were willing to receive help, I wonder, I wonder what their story would be. And I wonder uh, uh, what God could do in their lives. Not, not treating them like, uh, like, oh, yeah, I don't want to be around them. I don't want to deal with them. It's a matter of, wait a minute, no, I, I can... If we're confident in Christ's power and in the principles of God's word, and if we're confident in the spiritual battle and we're prayed up and we're ready to, to face the spiritual battle, we can be confident of, you know what, no matter who comes my way, I can, I can talk with this person. I can deal with this person. And if this person is willing to, I can help this person. We can go down that journey together, go on that journey down that path together. Now, uh, what he did then uh, in verse 11, the woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And so he's talking about this living water, everlasting life. And she was just not getting it at this point. She was not getting it. Verse 15, the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Now, what I like about this particular account and how Jesus dealt with this woman, you know, there, there are a lot of accounts where Jesus just, boom, instantly healed people. He, he taught, he preached, and people would believe on him. And it's, it's very cut and dry. In this case, it's not so cut and dry right away because he's leading her down this path where she's not, we, we get to see the progression of how her mind is changing and the light bulb is turning on and she's learning some things. And that in a lot of times as we deal with people, that is going to be more common than just all of a sudden, boom, cut and dry here. We tell them something, we give them the message of God's word and all of a sudden, boom, the light bulb turns on and that's going to be it. That's, it's... That's not as, doesn't seem to me to be as common. Now, for many people, it's a progression from one state of mind and one thought to, and then another. And as they learn and then they, they get convicted and then they, in this case, come to uh, believe on Jesus Christ. But for, for, those who, um, for those who are saved, and there are people who are saved who also deal with the bondage uh, that the devil uh, has for them. And they need to be set free. And, you know, when you're dealing with somebody who's in bondage, the first, the first and most important thing is that they are saved. They need to have the Holy Spirit in them to get deliverance from uh, the bondage uh, and, and help by the Lord, the Holy, by the Holy Spirit in their life. Um, so, but there are Christians who, who are that way. And, and so in the Christian life, there's a progression that takes place uh, as well um, of the Lord working and learning and, and being convicted and having change, changed life. Uh, so she's just not getting because she says in verse 15, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. So she's thinking still of real water, physical water. Jesus is talking about something spiritual. She's thinking of something that comes out of a well that, hey, I don't want to have to come to this well anymore. You mean there's water out there that means I'll never have to come to this well? Well, here's what Jesus did. This is where he turns it to something very personal. Go, call thy husband and come hither. Now, what does that have to do with water? <laughs> At 
Well, he's shifting it. He's getting her mind more now on the spiritual things, on the issues of sin and righteousness. And she says, uh, I have no husband. And Jesus answered back. He said, uh, thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast is not thy husband. And that saidst thou truly. Oh, wait a minute. Well, now we're getting to the deep, dark recesses of her life, the most personal things. And she's thinking, how, how does a person know this? How could this person know this? The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And so now her mind is shifted toward the spiritual things. And, but what did he do in dealing with her sin? He used discretion when addressing her sin. He didn't come right out and just say, you know, you... Uh, you sinner, what a filthy life you've lived of having all these husbands and just, he didn't just let her have it, you know, hitting her over the head with it. He was very discreet in this particular case of, of dealing with this, uh, this woman that he's getting her mind going here of, of, um, you know, go call, call your husband. Oh, I don't have a husband. Oh yeah. Cause she's living with a guy who's not her husband and she's had five husbands. So he's exposing some things in her life so she would come to the place where she knows, uh, realizes her need of a Savior because he's then going to um, reveal himself as the Messiah. So then this, the conversation goes to worship, where the proper place of worship was, and the Samaritans had their place, and the Jews said, nope, Jerusalem's the right place. And Jesus said, look, it's not going to be, the hour is going to come when it's not about the location as far as the particular city you're in. It's going to be, it has to do with worshiping in spirit and in truth. And so it had to do with the right thing, the right way, the right worship, the right way, worshiping the right person. That was what was most important, regard whether or not they were in Samaria or whether they were in Jerusalem. In verse 24, Jesus said, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. There are people who claim to worship God, but they don't worship God on his terms. And that's the key of worshiping him in truth. It needs to be based on what God says is right and what God says is proper worship, not just on, oh, but my intentions are right, my spirit's right, but doing the right thing the right way, God's way. So in verse 25, the woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. So he focused on her need for a savior. He said, now I'm the Messiah. So he got her mind, he shifted her thinking from the temporal, from the earthly to the spiritual. And, if, and for people, for us to meet people where they're at, we got to meet them where they're at regarding their, their earthly condition, that it's, there's not a limit of who we're going to talk to. It doesn't matter what they've done, what situation they're in. If they need help and they, they want help and, and uh, we, can, we can be there and we can be a help spiritually to them. We can use discretion when dealing with sin. Um, and, he, and then we focus on the person's need for a savior because that's where the true victory lies is if they're willing to trust Christ as their savior if they recognize that need and they believe on Christ from the heart and they're in the best place possible then to get the help and deliverance. Now, in that time of trusting Christ, they have deliverance from sin as far as uh, uh, deliverance from eternal punishment, uh, deliverance from God's wrath. But at the same time, there's still go th goings on in their life that still need to be worked out. They might have some bitterness they need to deal with. They might have some anger. They might have some some unresolved sin in their life that they need uh, to deal with. And, uh, and, and we can help be instruments of deliverance and promoting deliverance in, that, uh, in those cases. Now, the, uh, at this time, the, uh, while this is all going on, the disciples had gone to get some food in the town and they came back and they were surprised that he was talking with her. And um, so the woman left her water pot. So once again, her mind is still on the spiritual things because she came for water. She came for something earthly and then she left for a spiritual reason with a message that had a heavenly uh, purpose. And then she went in and said to the men, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then when they went out of the city and came unto him. So then the disciples are offering Jesus the food and, and uh, they said, uh, Master, eat. So here we got the food. 
Verse 32, but he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, hath any man brought him aught to eat? So I wonder, does somebody else give him something to eat? But notice verse 34, Jesus saith unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. So, in part, as part of spiritual warfare and meeting people where they're at, there needs to be such a great dedication to heavenly priorities and not be encumbered by the earthly things that doing God's work is what gives us the greatest satisfaction and fulfillment. That's what gave Jesus the greatest satisfaction and fulfillment, knowing that he was doing the Father's work. He said, my, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. What, what does meat, what, what's the purpose of food? It's to nourish us, it's to sustain us. And it satisfies when we get a nice full stomach. Ah, I feel so satisfied. Whew. I feel good now. But what about, you know, Jesus hadn't eaten at that point. Oh, but he was already satisfied. He was already filled up. Because, boy, he was doing something that was so much more meaningful than just eating food. He says, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And that should be our heart as well, is to do the will of the Lord and to finish his work. And that involves, what, 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 does, what, was finishing, what did finishing his work involve? Well, it involved him dealing with people. Dealing with people. Ministering to others. Uh, and our work, finishing the Lord's work in our lives, has to do with dealing with people, giving the gospel, helping people in their bondage, uh, giving them the truth of God's word. I didn't say helping people into bondage. I said helping people in their bondage, if you misheard me. Uh, but um, helping people get out of bondage, I should say, promoting deliverance in people's lives. And then Jesus went on and he said in verse 35, Say not ye there are yet four months and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Now, what was Jesus talking about here? Was he talking about a literal field? No, he was talking, once again, heavenly things, spiritual things. He's talking about people, the harvest field spiritually, that, look, there's a harvest field ready to be uh, harvested, reaped. And he, got, and he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And so Jesus taught his disciples to have a reaper mentality. And I borrowed that phrase, reaper mentality, from another pastor who uh, was preaching at a church planning conference a number of years ago. And um, uh, he <laughs> He said, uh, now this was the year that this was a church planning conference in Colorado. And um, Colorado is one of the first states to legalize recreational marijuana. And so uh, there was a few marijuana jokes that were said at that particular conference. Uh, and he got up and he said, I said a reaper mentality, not a reefer mentality. Um, we're dealing with the marijuana thing. Anyway, nobody got that one. Nobody laughed. You got it. You didn't laugh. Uh, <laughs> Oh, it has to do with marijuana. It's, it has to do with marijuana. So I was sitting there thinking, I don't know that I'm for making light and making jokes about this because this is a very serious issue. We know this around here now that it's legal recreationally. This is a very serious issue. So I wasn't necessarily 100% in favor of them making all these jokes about it there. But, you know, what, you know but they're, they're still at, funny at times. Uh, but it shouldn't desensitize us to the seriousness of the matter. But that's what he said. Um, so anyway, he, he's had a reaper mentality. Jesus taught his disciples to have a reaper mentality. Now, we, we might focus on the sowing. Oh, I'm sowing the seed. But when it comes to meeting people where they're at, we need to go into it with the mentality of the harvest, the harvest. Yes, there's, this, there's seeds that need to be sown, and we need to be patient in that process. But we also need to have the mentality that there's times when, all right, it's time. It's time to, time to go that next step here. It's time to go farther than just the sowing and just the watering. It's, it's now the reaping because the sowing and watering has been done, and now there's the reaping. And so we need to have that mentality where, um, where we are willing to go all the way, go all the way with, from the sowing, planting, uh, the, the sowing, the watering, and the reaping. And it says that, uh, he that he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. So the person who does the sowing may not be the one who does the reaping. And the person who does the reaping is the one, not the one who does the sowing. And so there's the working together 
as believers and in the churches and uh, that, um, that every person has a hand in someone else's life in some sense of sowing, watering, or the reaping. And you know, the reaping is the best part because that's, you get to that good part. You get to that good part and uh, it, can, it can seem painstakingly long uh, for, uh, for that to happen. Uh, but at the same time, we must not be discouraged. We must keep that reaping mentality uh, that God still saves, God still delivers, and we can have a hand in that. Um, and at this time, you know, Jesus is telling him in verse 38, I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. And so he's saying specifically to his disciples, Look, there are others who have already done the work. There are some who have already given the message. There are some that already have, have, have plowed the field, uh, but here now it's, it's, it's harvest time. And so Jesus uh, gives us a good example in John 4 of meeting someone where they're at. He went to Samaria. He went to that place where the Jews didn't go, went, didn't want to go, and, they, uh, and he was willing to talk with this woman and just have a conversation with her and lead her to talking about spiritual things. Now, turn over to John chapter 8, the second example tonight. Second example tonight, John chapter 8. Uh, verse 1, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people sat, came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. First of all, what, how did Jesus respond to this? Verse 6, but Jesus, middle of verse 6, but Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Now they're trying for the, uh, they're trying to get, uh, uh, they're trying for the outrage factor. They're trying for the sensationalism. So, because notice the setting here, just as I'm here uh, preaching, teaching tonight, and I'm in the midst of you, in front of you, Jesus is there in the synagogue teaching, and so here come the Pharisees. Now picture someone marching someone through the door, uh, picture modern day Pharisees uh, marching someone through the door and setting her right down in the middle, right in the middle of the church service and saying, Pastor, this person was caught in the very act of adultery. That'd be pretty sensational, you know, right in front of everybody, uh, going for the outrage. And, and they're trying to go for the outrage because we know that because of their, they're saying, you know, Moses in the law said she should be stoned. So they're trying to, to get justification. And, but really what their, multi, their, most, their big, biggest motive was, was um, trying to trap Jesus. Because wait a minute, here's Jesus who's helping people. But yet if he's helping people, he's not going to want to stone them, but the law says she should be stoned. So, all right, what are you going to do, Jesus? How are you going to handle this? But notice, for the, so the first thing, he, he, he stooped down and wrote in the ground. Wrote on the ground. So first of all, how did he meet this person where she was at? Well, first of all, the report of what she had done didn't phase Jesus. He didn't, he didn't stand up. Oh, I can't believe you did that. I can't believe you did that. Now, let me just give you a little hint here, and we're going to, we'll be getting into the more practical aspects of this in the next uh, few weeks, hopefully. But let me just say, if you're sitting down, discipling someone, counseling them, and here's this person who's just coming from a messed up background and from a bond, and bondage to sin, and they're talking to you about their life, and they, they talk, and maybe they, they, they get, get into some pretty deep stuff, some pretty serious stuff of what they've done in their life. The way not to handle it and the way that will hinder you from helping them is if you sit there, oh, I can't believe that. Uh, that is not the way to approach talking with someone <laughs> because that's going to put them on the defensive. Oh, I wonder what this person thinks. Like, oh, they're going to think badly of me. And they might put up a wall. They might close the door. You might hinder yourself. Hinder, they might you might be then prevented from helping them further. Jesus didn't face him. And while we are staunchly against sin and we take sin seriously, 
when we're dealing personally with another individual who needs help, they need deliverance, they need the Lord's working in their life, whether it's they need to be saved or whether they're saved and they just need uh, deliverance from some sin in their life, we need to also have the same attitude of we're not going to be phased by what we hear. We're not going to be phased by what we hear. Because what happens is um, people, when they're sharing some of the most personal things in their life, oftentimes, and you're trying to pinpoint, all right, what's, what's this key here? What's the, what's the big thing that's keeping them in bondage that they need to get right? What are, they, what are they angry about? What are they bitter about? And oftentimes they will start talking about the surface things and they'll get into it and really maybe not even consciously or, or deliberately, but they are paying attention to how you respond. And depending on how you respond, uh, how you respond could determine, will determine how much further they're willing to go in getting to, in help uh, that, that we can get to the root of the matter. So, we must not have, we must not give in to the shock factor of, oh, that was just so horrible. That was just, how could you have done such a thing? That's not something to say when you're discipling, counseling somebody. <laughs> how could you have done such a thing? Now, I, wa- I, I will say, I was, uh, I, I, had, I met with somebody and I, sa- I did say, this particular person, uh, I had to be blunt with, and I said, look, I said, God is not under any obligation to bless your fornication. I said that to the person. Um, I haven't seen the person since. (laughs) (laughs) I know 100% everything I told this person. And now, at the same time, that was not what I started with. That was toward the end. Um because it was needing to communicate the seriousness of that sin. Because this is a person who probably would not have been, um, probably would have looked more casually at sin. And so in that particular case, I said that, but the the first part of it was trying to help this person in the great despair they were in, in the great depression they were in. And so that was the first thing I was dealing with. And so I 100% was giving the right advice and counsel to this person. Now, whether or not they were willing to receive it was up to them. But one of the things I did say was, you know, God is not under any obligation to bless. And, uh, and, and the response was, well, did, uh, do you think that's why this is happening? Do you think that's why this event, this particular event in this person's life happened? I said, "I, I don't know for sure about that. I don't know for sure about that. I wasn't going to give false assurance. Oh, yeah, you just stop the fornication and this will be all better. But what, what this person needed was to just be directed to the Lord in a closer walk with the Lord. And, and hopefully this person was actually born again. I'm not 100% sure of that. But um, I think they, they claimed to be, so I couldn't really go any farther with that because they, I had to treat them as if they were a Christian. They, they um, certainly professed to be. Um, but just what, but when you talk to somebody and you're dealing with somebody and they go into details and they, they let you know, well, I, you know, didn't commit fornication. <laughs> now they aren't going to use that word. <laughs> I use the word cause it's the Bible word. Um, but, uh, it didn't phase me. I didn't have a shocked look on my face. No. Um, how about a person who has been in the witchcraft or New Age movement? You've cast spells on people? You've played with you know, Ouija boards and Dungeons and Dragons? Okay, I'm showing you what not to do when you're helping somebody, trying to help somebody. <laughs> that doesn't mean we're glossing it over. It just means, you know what, we're, we're, we're confident in our position in Christ and our spiritual 
position and in the spiritual battle, and we are taking an offensive position, so we're not going to be stunned and phased by the, the things that we hear and the things that people tell us when we're trying to help people. It'd be like in a, in a battle, you know, uh, how, how effective would an army be if all of a sudden the uh, enemy rolls out this brand new missile they've been working on and, uh, and all of a sudden the army, the other countries, uh, we're toast. I mean, we're done. This is bad. That's not going to, that's not going to help them win the battle. <laughs> They're, you, if you're going to try to win, if you're going to win the battle, you say, all right, we got to figure out how to overcome this. We got to figure this out. This is looking pretty serious. As a matter of fact, I, I just heard, I, I saw some news about China back in August tested a new hypersonic missile that can go like, you know, over a thousand miles, a couple thousand miles, because they send it up into space, like with a rocket type of thing, and they can send it up and then there's this attachment to it and they can, and it's how they were a couple dozen miles off their target. But apparently the report said that the government officials, the U.S. government officials, were kind of basically were stunned at this. Like, they've got something like this? They're working on They're, they're this close to something like that? Boy, this is, this is getting serious. That's not a good morale booster. You know, when I read that, I'm thinking, that's not a good morale booster <laughs> as an American. If that's, now, that's, that was secondhand information. That was not somebody quoted from our government saying that. But that was the report. So the report of what she had done did not phase Jesus. And, um, and, and not only that, not only was she taken in adultery, they said she was taken in the very act. Now, I'd have been more stunned at the Pharisees, like, you did what? You went in where she was committing adultery and you took her in the very act? That would have been more of like, what are you? <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, now, what did Jesus, so Jesus, uh, they, they kept asking Jesus about his, uh, about what they should do as, as far as the stoning. So they kept asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that was without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. So he answered once again, very discreetly, very wisely. He didn't give them the straight answer of, yeah, the law says she should be stoned, stone her. And he didn't come right out and say, no, no, we're not going to stone her. He put the burden back on them. If you're without sin, you can cast the first stone. Well, then that brought his answer. That brought conviction. It says, and uh, he wrote it on the ground again. And some people say, I don't know. It does. The Bible doesn't tell us what he was writing on the ground. Some people say he was writing their sins on the ground. There's various potential. I don't know. Uh, in verse, uh, verse 9, And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, the woman standing in the midst. Uh, some, some of the reasons why, one of the reasons why people think that Jesus might have been writing down their sins is that they, they went out beginning at the eldest to the last. That was one of the ideas, like Jesus was writing down in, in order. <laughs> All right, here's you, here's what you've done. Uh, but the Bible doesn't say that. The point is they were convicted by their own conscience. And so here's Jesus and the woman in the middle of this uh, synagogue service, this teaching time. And so then how did Jesus deal with this woman when the Pharisees were gone, when these people who were putting the pressure on him uh, and tempting him, trying to trick him, trap him in his words, what was, the, what was his response? How did he handle it? And verse 10, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? Um, so he asked her a question. She said, no man, Lord, because they were gone. Nobody's here anymore. So it, Jesus said, uh, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So he did not come down hard on her. And that is when we're going to meet people where they're at, we cannot be phased by what sins they've committed and the experiences of their life. We, can, we cannot let that phase us. I mean, the fact is, in your head and in your heart, you might have to process some of that thinking like, wow, this is really something. But as far as how you respond in your countenance, your facial expressions, your words back to them, it cannot be one of shock and awe. I mean, there's times you could, you know, maybe there's a, a, um, 
you know, you, you would, I, I, a lot of times I just recognize what they're saying, like, okay, all right, and oh, wow, yeah, yeah, that's, it's quite an experience. You know, if, if they're communicating that they look at this as quite, uh, um, you know, a shocking experience, I might just recognize, well, yeah, certainly that is, uh, but not, uh, not being the one initiating this. You, you robbed a bank <laughs> or whatever, whatever the case might be. Now, typically, that's not what you get into when you're counseling, discipling people is they, they usually haven't robbed the bank. It's more usually interpersonal stuff, family, relationships, you know, various things. Uh, but what people need is someone that they can trust Someone they feel secure with. Um, and, and so if you don't get phased by it and you don't come down hard on them, it builds up the trust and the security level where then you can get to the point of what Jesus did with this woman when he said, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. So what did he do? Did he excuse her sin? No, he, he didn't. He didn't excuse her sin. And nor should we, when we're meeting people where they're at and we're dealing with people, uh, we should not excuse the sin. But at the same time, there's a process we go through and step by step needing God's wisdom, needing discernment uh, in how we address the things we're dealing with. Because our ultimate goal, it's what Jesus' goal was, was deliverance. He said, go and sin no more. This wasn't living in sinless perfection. This was you don't have to stay in this sin anymore. You don't have to keep on sinning. You don't have to have those besetting sins and continue repeating the same things. He, you know, he promoted deliverance and not condemnation. And so that's, that's what our end goal is. Our goal, what we have our eye on is deliverance. So we do have to recognize sin as sin, and it's important for the other person to recognize sin as sin but a lot of it first gets, has to do with getting to know that person, meeting them where they're at. If we're going to have, and this is assuming we have the time, this is someone that we know and someone who we have the opportunity to help in a bigger way. Um, you know, obviously, if, if, if it's just a person you're meeting and you don't know if you ever see them again, you obviously, if they're, if they're lost, you just want to give them the gospel and, and um, give them a gospel tract or be able to take the time to talk to them about it if you have that opportunity. Uh, or... Um, you know, there's, there's, so it depends on your situation, who you're dealing with and when you're dealing with them. But our end result, the end goal, the, the objective here is to promote deliverance and not condemnation. But we've got to meet people where they're at because, as I said at the beginning, with the um, anxiety issues, the, uh, there's so much anger. Um, there's a, uh, a, I think he's 41 years old now. And he's going to be released uh, on parole uh, from New York uh, prison. And uh, he, he was 13 years old, and I believe it said he, he, he killed a four-year-old. And he spent all these years in prison. But they had a picture of him when he was in the court when he was 13 years old. And I looked at his, in his eyes, he's kind of looking over at the camera. I don't know if he's looking right into the camera. But you look in that kid's eyes, that 13-year-old's eyes, and you can just, it screams out, this is a troubled person here. That somehow, whatever was going on in his life, the anger or whatever it was all those years ago, escalated into just committing a horrendous, horrendous act. Horrendous, awful, awful. And that's what we're talking about is, is that there's so many issues going on in people's hearts. And once in a while, it spills over into something bigger. But our desire is for people, our objective is for people to be delivered from those things before they turn into much bigger issues. But he's, he's 41 now. And the article didn't say what he's like as far as how's he doing or I don't know. But he's going to be released. 41 years old. And, um, but
But what would even drive a person to do such a thing? Think about the hatred and anger and bitterness that must be in a person's heart. And let me tell you, that is in a lot of people's hearts. Not everybody does those types of things. But this, these are the types of issues we need to meet people where they're at. And we need to be able to face them head on and promote deliverance in people's lives. And it'll make a tremendous world of difference. Jesus met people where they're at, no matter what they had done, no matter where they were. He didn't condone their sin, but he didn't bash them over the head either, figuratively speaking. Um, he met them where they were at, and he led them to the place of, in the first case, in John 4, of telling the woman that he's the Messiah, and then also giving a message of deliverance to the woman in chapter 8, go and sin no more, I don't condemn you. What a great example Jesus is in these chapters and, of course, throughout his earthly ministry, that we can meet people where they're at. We don't need to be afraid. But we do need to be winning the warfare in our own life. We do need to be in a good position, an offensive position in our own spiritual life so that we are in the best state possible, the best place possible. And it requires, absolutely requires a walk with God. It absolutely requires a life of prayer. It requires a, a, a walking in the Word. It requires a warfare mentality. And we've covered a lot of these things. So we've, it has to do with putting on the armor of God, living a life of faith. We've covered this over these weeks. And this, so this is that transition point into the practical nitty-gritty of here's what we're dealing with, here's how you can deal with it and help others as well as some things that will help us. Let's meet people where they're at with the gospel and with that message of deliverance.